Keith Murdoch is a software engineer, material apps. science researcher, and renewable energy systems designer. He has been a dedicated amateur astronomer since 1996 and is part of the lecture series team for the Rockland Astronomy Club. He is a frequent lecturer on visual astronomy and planetary science. He is a self-professed, professed, quote, extreme astro tourist, unquote, and has observed from near the summit of Mauna Kea, used the 60 inch telescope Mount Wilson at Mount Wilson, and viewed through several large amateur telescopes in the Australian outback. In October 2005, Keith used the 82-inch Struve telescope at McDonald Observatory in Texas to locate and acquire the recently discovered dwarf planet Eris, an observation never before accomplished. I'd like to add that I saw Eris when it was a planet. So I've seen the 10th planet, okay. and now nobody can find it anymore. Okay. Yeah, I think you need this back. I, my voice projects. Maybe they heard me. I don't know. Okay. Okay, thank you. Did he come up like that? Oh, this is the second one. All right. I, I don't need two. Okay. Well, I'm very happy to be here. And if I remember correctly, this is my second lecture for the MHAA uh, astronomy group. I think I gave one back about 15 years ago on the Tunguska impact, if anybody remembers that. Willie remembers, okay. Willie is our historian here. So I am uh, I'm here to present the Orion Molecular Cloud, which uh, I've titled the Cradle of Creation because this is the uh, closest star formation molecular cloud to our solar system. And as a result, it's a place that we can, uh, we can study uh, quite intimately. And uh, it's also hosts the Orion Nebula, which is uh, my favorite dark sky object, especially in the winter time. And, um, and it's uh, seeing as I'm a student of planetary science, I figured I would learn where solar systems come from. And so this was a great way to, uh, to teach me things that I wanted to learn so I can share them with you. I, I lecture so I can learn things. And so, uh, so this is a topic that very much interested me. By the way, just briefly, the last time I gave this lecture was in January and I was on the, the uh, distant Pacific Island of Saipan visiting relatives. And so this, this shot up here is where I gave the lecture on somebody's back patio on a hill overlooking the Saipan Lagoon uh, right around sunset. And I was drinking fresh local beer while I was giving the lecture. I, I don't think I can beat that. I, I like this hall here, but I, I don't think you I can, can quite get into that, uh, that level. And I enjoyed it thoroughly. So, uh, so here we are, uh, star stuff come to consciousness, looking upward and pondering our origins. And, uh, and then Joni Mitchell chimes in on very much the same, same level. So, uh, so I already said that I, I jumped down a deep rabbit hole when I went to investigate giant molecular clouds. And this is not the only one of the giant molecular clouds. It's just the one that we happen to have uh, the easiest access to because it's so close to us. Uh, the Orion molecular cloud is about 1600 light years away. So in galactic distances, that's just in our backyard. So here's what I'm going to go through. I'm going to talk about the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex and, of course, M42, the Orion Nebula, the Horsehead Dark Nebula, the Flame Nebula, which is also a reflection, emission, and dark nebula, the trapezium, of course, in M42, Barnard's Loop, which most of us have never seen, but it's a supernova remnant, and the OB1 Association, which is not OB1 Kenobi, but close, and, uh, and it's uh, the collection of really bright class O and B stars where the uh, Orion Nebula and a good deal of the Orion uh, uh, constellation are, uh, are situated. We have proplids, bot globules, and tadpoles. They're all closely related. And uh, Herbig Haro objects, uh, protostars, and uh, super bubbles, supernovas, and shock waves. It's a lot of material. We'll see how far we get. How much time do I have, by the way? I'll take it, I'll take it. 
Okay. And uh, here is uh, the Orion constellation in visible light. And uh, many of us have seen this, of course. And uh, let's see, here's, I, I want to point out things for the mouse. Let me, okay. let me borrow the mouse sure. here. Okay. So here, of course, we have Orion's belt, Alnatak, Alnalam, and Mintaka. Alnatak is uh, the uh, brightest class O star in our, uh, in our northern sky. And uh, it is uh, considerably hotter than our sun. And its uh, visual brightness is quite a bit less than its, uh, than its true brightness because it is so hot, it emits most of its light in the ultraviolet. Um, here, of course, we have the sword with the Orion Nebula looking pinkish right there in the center. And over here is the famous or infamous Betelgeuse. We'll talk more about Betelgeuse later. And Rigel, uh, the, one, of the, uh, one of the feet of uh, Orion the Hunter. So um, over here, by the way, at the head is a not terribly uh, bright star named Maisa. But I will tell you that Maisa, if I've got that pronounced right, is a multicolored double star. The two stars separated by about four and a half arc seconds, not too hard to split. And it's just a beautiful pairing. And if any of you haven't taken a good look at it, I highly recommend it. So let's go next here. Um, so talking about Rigel, Rigel's a bright blue giant star at Orion's foot. And it has a small companion star that can be separated from its primary with a good telescope on a night with steady skies. If any of you are interested in uh, splitting Sirius, practicing with Rigel is a, is a good way to start. The companion star is not a white dwarf and it's not quite as dim as, uh, as the pup is compared to Sirius, but it's, it's a little challenging. So um, Rigel's about 10 times, 10,000 times more luminous than our sun and 20 times more massive. And it's almost to the end of its life. So it's already burning helium instead of hydrogen. And uh, it will explode. Uh, not, not tomorrow, but maybe in the next million years or so. And it'll be a, a class, a type two supernova and leave behind a neutron star or a black hole. Now, Betelgeuse is where things get really interesting. And uh, it's a red giant star near the end of its life. And um, a couple of years ago, Betelgeuse dimmed dramatically. Most of you may remember that. It wound up uh, becoming oh, I don't know, maybe about a magnitude dimmer than it usually is in, in tonight's sky. And, uh, and so nobody quite knew what was happening. They researched it and found out that it had a large eruption of gas and uh, dust from, uh, from one portion of the star. So it had dimmed unevenly. And as the, uh, as the material condensed after it left the star, it, it basically eclipsed a substantial portion of the star's light. And uh, it, that has dissipated, Betelgeuse is back to its, its normal self. It's about 40% brighter right now than it is on the average, but this isn't that unusual. What is unusual is that Betelgeuse being a variable star has uh, changed its cycle. It used to go through a full cycle of brightening and dimming every 400 days. But since this great dimming event, it has, uh, tightened its cycle to once every 130 days. And so, uh, so something is funny going with, on with Betelgeuse and we're still not sure exactly what's happening there. But we don't think it's gonna supernova tomorrow or even next year. Um, maybe, maybe in 10,000 or 100,000 years it will blow. I don't think we're gonna be around for it. When Betelgeuse does blow, it's gonna be a spectacular sight in our daytime sky. It will be visible in the daytime we are not close enough to Betelgeuse at 800 light years for it, to, uh, for it to cause any harm here on Earth, which is kind of reassuring. Um, Betelgeuse is a runaway star. It came from uh, the Orion molecular cloud and in, front, in fact, from the Orion OB Association, which is roughly 1600 light years away. And now Betelgeuse is 800 light years away. And it's creating a wake as it plows through the interstellar medium. It's a, it's a shock wave that's actually quite, uh, 
quite dramatic. So the shock wave is four light years wide. So according to my notes, Betelgeuse will explode in about 100,000 years. Uh, here's a picture of the dimming of Betelgeuse. And so you can get a, see, a sense for how Betelgeuse was obscured. And you can see that it only obscures towards the, to one edge toward the center. And the rest of it's pretty much full brightness. Um, so the gas erupted from this dark spot and then it condensed into dust. And that was what, what blocked it out. Oh, so the data backing this theory about the dimming was not only uh, gathered by astronomical telescopes, but it was confirmed by the Himawari 8 weather satellite. I know the name Himawari 8 because when we were out in Saipan, that was the data we watched to see where the typhoons were coming from. So Himawari 8 was, was very interesting to us. Anyway, just surprising you get astronom astronomical data from it. Um, so here is a deep field from Bob Gendler. And uh, here, I'll borrow the mouse again. And uh, what's interesting about this is you can see all this red stuff here. And what the, the red stuff is, is uh, hydrogen alpha. This is all ionized hydrogen gas that is part of the Orion molecular cloud. And it's uh, being lit up by the ultraviolet light from all of these bright OB1 association stars. And they ionize the hydrogen and the hydrogen then recombines with its uh, uh, walkabout electrons and, uh, and emits hydrogen alpha light. So we are looking here mostly at the molecular gas, which has gotten excited and then calms down again. So again, here we have the Orion Nebula. Here is the Horsehead Nebula and the Flaming Star Nebula, both of which are lit up by this bright star here, Alnitak, that I was talking before. And uh, so that's ionizing this gas here. And uh, let me show you the next slide here. Okay. Um, so here, these, uh, these stars I was talking about, you have uh, the Orion OB1 association and uh, the three stars of Orion's belt right here are part of one group of OB1 stars. And then right here, you just have this small envelope, OB1b, but it's very important because it contains, contains the trapezium, which are uh, you know, class O, B, and uh, I guess A stars that are in a very, very tight, unstable uh, configuration. There are actually eight stars in the trapezium instead of the four that we're most familiar with. I'll get into that a little later. And uh, here we are again in uh, one more, uh, how do I advance here? Okay, there we go. Okay. And here we have more H alpha light, um, M42 again. M43 is actually part of the same group as M42 and there's a dust lane that separates them. And uh, you get a lot bigger feeling of the cloud itself when you see all of this, uh, this red hydrogen alpha light. This is, by the way, Barnard's loop here, uh, at least a portion of Barnard's loop, and that is a supernova remnant. Um, okay, so what is a molecular cloud? All right, we can go into that. Um, molecular clouds are cold and dense gas. They're not ionized as a general rule, and they're almost all molecular hydrogen gas. This is the material that uh, was most of the body of the universe after the Big Bang condensed into atoms. Um, it contains half of our galaxy's mass, but only 1% of the volume. So these are quite more dense than uh, just star fields without gas in them. And uh, this is where stars are formed. So this is uh, the molecular clouds form and dissolve on a time scale of only about 10 million years. In, uh, in cosmic time, that's just like that. And that's about the time it takes for a star to pass through one of the spiral arms on its 250 million year journey around the sun, around, around the galaxy. And here is a radio contour map in 
carbon monoxide radio waves. And so why carbon monoxide? Well, because you don't really get a good radio transmission from molecular hydrogen, but you, the carbon monoxide parallels molecular hydrogen. So if you look where the carbon monoxide is, you can see where the hydrogen is likely to be. And so this map was generated almost 40 years ago. And uh, one of the guys on the map, uh, here, let me see if I can see his name here. Uh, here, hang on, uh, previous, where is he? No, okay. This guy right here, Joe Moskowitz, he is a member of the Rockland Astronomy Club. And, uh, and I just happened to stumble across his name when I was researching this and name was misspelled. And I just asked him, um, is this you, Joe? And it was work he did gathering the data for this map back when he was a graduate student in astrophysics. And he said, yeah, they always misspelled my name. I've never been able to fix that. But, uh, but anyway, this was a very interesting piece of work that he got involved with. And I was uh, delighted to find that out. He was really surprised. Almost nobody connects him with that. But there it was, a blast from the past. So here, let's uh, go here to, uh, let's see, this one here. Um, this, uh, this here is Barnard's loop uh, in, in radio emission, uh, or at least it shows where it is. And in here, you have the Orion Nebula. And up here, you've got, uh, I think this is Orion's belt in here somewhere. It's a little hard to see in this map. But, uh, but this is how you isolate the different uh, uh, molecular, uh, the OB associations and dense parts of the Orion molecular cloud. Okay, and here again, we're panning back and you can see uh, this is all stars over here. And you're looking at it in, uh, in visual light. And so you don't see any of the gas, you just see the stars. Well, like I said, the stars are the tip of the iceberg. You come over here and the gas far outweighs the stars and uh, kind of dwarfs them, but you have to see it in infrared or possibly in H alpha light, but you're not gonna see it in ordinary visual light. Um, and here we're panning in to the Orion Nebula, which has also got a lot more going on than what you can see in visual light. Again, you can see a lot of this, uh, this molecular gas here, which is being excited by the very hot stars in the middle of the trapezium. So the trapezium is the uh, excitation that lights up all of this gas. And again, ionizes the hydrogen. Um, and I like to call this from the Orion Museum of Abstract Art. There are just, I could cover an entire wall with images of the Orion Nebula taking at different scales and with different kinds of light and different interpretations of the colors that were done there. None of them would look the same, but they would all be spectacular. Uh, so this was first seen by William Herschel in 1774. And he later described it as an unformed fiery mist, the chaotic material of future suns. How did he know that? This conjecture of his wasn't confirmed until about a century later. He was right on the money, but he couldn't say why he was on the money. So sometimes, sometimes people get lucky, but uh, was it chance favors the prepared mind. He was there to observe it and he was there to think about it. Uh, so here we have uh, an infrared image from the James Webb Space Telescope showing you more gas and dust. And uh, what's interesting is you can see, you can see filaments of matter here and like dense clumps and lines. And these are areas that may very well birth new generations of stars as they get disturbed and collapse in on themselves. It's not homogeneous by any means. So there are thin areas and there are dense areas. Um, and it's got uh, some protostars in here. I can't point them out. I don't have that information. Surrounded by discs of dust and gas, and that is where planets form. Beautiful image. Okay, and here's another image from the Orion Museum of Op Art from, uh, from Bob Gendler, who's 
famous astrophotographer. Many of you have seen his work. <laughs> and another close up. See how different all these images are? And anyway, this is just eye candy. But um, this eye candy here was taken by another Rockland Astronomy Club member, Vinnie Coulihan. And he's been doing some wonderful astrophotography, both from our dark sky sites and from his home in Scarsdale. It's amazing what you can do in a suburban site if you have the right filters. And he's, uh, I, I wish I knew half of what he did about imaging. So if you look over here, this wart here is M43. And nobody pays much attention to M43 because if you're there, why don't you just look at M42? And it's, it's kind of too bad because it's interesting in its own right. Um, so this is a, a dense dust lane here of gas, which is uh, too dense to be properly illuminated by the, the UV coming from the trapezium. And uh, it's also got H2 star forming regions. There's a very bright star in here, New Orionis. And, uh, and so it's lighting up all of this gas right here locally. And here's another dark lane passing through. And uh, so this, this again is a large hot sun with a short lifetime. And, uh, and so when you see a large hot sun like that in a molecular cloud, it's very frequently associated with the star forming regions. So you're gonna be hatching, hatching stars right in here as well as all through this cloud. And I just found out the name of this clump of nebulosity over here. This is NGC 1975. And again, something people don't pay too much attention to because it's so close to the Orion Nebula. But this is a reflection nebula. And it's uh, the, the dust in here is lit up by these stars and again, some by the trapezium as well. And you can see this little divot here. That's a clump of dense molecular gas. So which is, uh, uh, more opaque than the rest of the medium. And uh, here we have M42 combined visible and infrared light from Spitzer. And here we go. Here we're going into the, the heart of the Orion Nebula. This is the trapezium here, these four stars. And let me see if I can pick out the other stars. Here's one of them. And here's another one. And maybe these two in here. These two over here are the ones that you can see on a good amateur uh, telescope on a nice, dark, steady night. And uh, you know you can't always see them. But if you go out to a large telescope, you can see eight of them in there. Um, so you can see six of them with an eight-inch reflector if everything is going for you. Um, and if you bear in really deeply. See this little guy up here? That is a propylid. Looks like a little tadpole swimming in towards the, uh, towards the core of the trapezium. Well, it's not really swimming in and it's not a tadpole. This is a, uh, a globule of gas, which is being ionized. See, it's got a, a uh, bright head over here and kind of a tail trailing behind it. So this has got about maybe maybe 50 times the diameter of our solar system. And, uh, and some gas is being eroded away at the top and other is being condensed by the harsh UV light and the sh any shock waves coming from, from these stars here. The, the stellar wind inside this is, uh, is very strong. So it shapes anything that's inside that place. Um, now, I'll digress here a little bit, talk about extreme astrotourism. Uh, I have bored into the trapezium on uh, two nights on two very large telescopes. I've seen this from the 82 inch Struve telescope at McDonald Observatory. Very dark sky, it just got declared part of a, uh, an international dark sky park in Big Bend uh, uh, National Park. And uh, you could see at very high magnification, you could see maybe a dozen or more of these tadpoles, these proplids, swimming towards the heart of the trapezium. And it just got me all choked up. It was the closest to a spiritual experience I've had in astronomy, because I knew that in there was a, uh, a, a fierce battle between birth and death, that each one of those proplids 
was either going to condense into a protostar and then a solar system, or it was going to get chewed up by all of the ultraviolet light and eventually just dispersed into the interstellar medium. And it all depended on how dense and how massive the proplid was and how intense the radiation was around it. So flip a coin, are you gonna live or are you gonna die? Are you going to give birth to a, uh, a solar system and possibly life, maybe even intelligent life? Or are you just gonna be gone like a, a will of the wisp? So very poetic. I saw the same thing from Mount Wilson. I might just wanna add that I'm not, a really special person for having done this because any of you here could go to Mount Wilson or the Struve telescope at uh, McDonald Observatory. You can rent those telescopes for a night. Now, I didn't rent them by myself. I'm not made of that kind of money, but you get together a team of about a dozen astronomers and you come up with a really good list of objects that you want to look at and they'll take you to them and they'll steer the scope and, uh, and you can all get some time in the eyepiece. And it's just, it will cost you less than the airfare to rent that telescope if you do it that way. Well, you could, you could. Um, I may wind up being out there in April. I still haven't looked at all the conditions because I'm tempted to uh, see the eclipse out in that neighborhood and then go over to McDonald Observatory afterwards. This is not yet solidified. And April's a little tough to see the eclipse because the weather's going to be dicey everywhere. But we'll do our best. Anyway, uh, next. And uh, here we go. Here is the horse said. And uh, it's just from this particular point of view that it looks like a horse's head. It's complete coincidence. But that shape alone makes it something that everybody wants to photograph. It's almost impossible to see this. Uh, with, uh, with a visual telescope. It's, it's more designed for astrophotography. A big scope in uh, very dark, steady skies, you might be able to see it. Has anybody here actually seen the horse head with their eyes? Anybody? You have seen it, Willie. What, how do you see it? Uh, and how are the skies? Huh? How were the skies that night? Well, uh, it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've got. I, I have seen it. Oh, and, and where did you see it? Winter Star Party. I've seen it from other places, but it was really it was it was amazing because they have really good seeing, which helps. But you know, it's dark, and and the contrast was just superb. And I and using a filter. I tried, okay, how, how much power do I need? How much aperture do I need? And I started dropping down and I got all the way down to, uh, was I down? Was I, I definitely saw the TV 85, 85 millimeter scope. Uh, you have to lower the power, but with the contrast, it, it works. It, 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 I can still see it. I was amazed. What kind of filters were you using to do that? Just an H beta filter. Uh-huh. Okay, because it's dark. I mean, you're, it's not emitting any light at all. You just want to cut right. out the light that's interfering with it. Right. Yeah. You see all the, you know, the 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 the, uh, the bright nebula behind it. Uh huh. So if <laughs> I used a O3 filter or a UHC filter, you think I'd get similar results? Uh, I think probably not. Uh, the UHC will sort of work, but you really need H beta. Okay. All right. I'll have to get one of those. Okay, thank you. What's your name, by the way? Scott. Scott York. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, here's another image of a uh, very colorful image from, from Vinny again. Oops, hang on. There we go. Okay. And uh, you can see that it's uh, very, this is again near, uh, near Alnitak. And so this gas here is being brightly lit up by that star. And it's just because this gas here, this dust, is so dense that it is uh, almost certainly in the foreground of all of this. And it's just, uh, you're looking at the shadow. You're looking at the shadow of, uh, of the horse head against this very bright background. Okay, now here, 
here's where this horse head really gets interesting. Um, so Hubble shot here, you can see a few stars in, in the middle of the horse head, not too many, but you come over here to the JWST and not only do you see a lot more stars, but you can also see the horse head isn't black anymore, it's pink. And of course, you're talking about infrared light, they can choose what, uh, what wavelengths they want to display as pink, but they're trying to go show you as much as possible different information. So it's not just, uh, they're not just fake colors. It's, it's, a, it's a way of seeing and interpreting and showing you as much detail as they can. So this is all pink because you're in the infrared and you're looking at this gas glowing from the radiated uh, uh, light and heat and excitation from the nearby bright stars. So this, this gas is actually quite a bit warmer than, uh, than say the cold gas right in the middle of uh, something further away than the horse head. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's more active. The molecules are moving around quite a bit faster there. I think what, what's interesting- I'm sorry, what? What's interesting about this is that the, when you go just beyond you know, the, the borders of the, the horse head in the James Webb image, you see no gas and it's just stars. You know, all uh, that. Well, you, you definitely see that above the horse head and down right, below right, here, but, right, next to the horse head, you it. see gas. Yeah, so, but, but in that in the dark area, you're not seeing the hydrogen at all. It's, it, and it's completely, um, you're looking right through it basically to the stars beyond. Well, now it's interesting. If you look at the visible light here, you're going to be capturing some of that H2 light. And, uh, and so this gas here is going to be, uh, ionized. And over mm -hmm. here, uh, even if you're getting ionized uh, H2 light, you are not going to see it in this background. And it may be that what you're seeing over here is more dust than it is gas. Right. I'm not sure. I'm hypothesizing here, but that would yeah. be one explanation of it. Let's go back and look at one of those earlier pictures. Oh, hang on. Another question up here. Sorry. Oh, hang on. Let, let me see that. Uh, no, no, no. Hang on. Let me get it. Okay, you get it. Okay, right in the middle where? Uh, you're talking about right there? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I would say they were proplids if they were being excited by a nearby uh, very hot star. And, uh, and I mean, there is Alnitak, but I don't know if Alnitak is close enough to do that. So it could be just it could just be lumps. Um, I won't say they're not proplids, but I think it's less likely than the other ones that we saw. I'm gonna show you a bunch of proplids later on. And we, we can think about that. I'm not gonna say you're wrong though. Okay, and the flame nebula here, um, where are we here? Uh, hang on, here we go, okay. Um, so we're sending Alnitak's bright UV light into the flame nebula. And, uh, and then we've got all of this dark gas right in front of it, which is much, much denser, of course. And uh, right in the center of the flame nebula, you also have some newly formed stars, most of which have got disks forming around the outside, circumstellar disks. And so Chandra X-ray Observatory has found several hundred young stars out of an estimated population of 800 stars there. So I think the young stars would have a different X-ray spectrum than say the more mature stars would. And here's Barnard's Loop. Now, Barnard's Loop is uh, an emission nebula and it's also embedded in the Orion molecular cloud. It's a supernova remnant and it takes a large loop around the, uh, more or less around the Orion Nebula at some distance. It covers about 10 degrees of sky, which is huge for a supernova remnant. And uh, so it's believed that the stars in the Orion Nebula are responsible for ionizing the loop. Um, so 300 light years in diameter. And it was, it's about 2 million years old, they think. And uh, again, long exposure astrophotography. 
Has anybody seen the Barnard Loop with their own eye? You have seen it. No, 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 no. I'm talking about I'm talking about personal photons here. I'm not talking about photons that came from the electric company. I'm a personal <laughs> photon guy. I'm a little chauvinistic about that. My apologies. Um, yeah, I look again. at big telescopes and I don't do astrophotography, but I respect the work of the people that do. Yeah, again, from, from the Winter Star Party. There you go. See the universe hold, with your own eyes. Okay, yeah, I like hold that. that. I'm hold one of that you guys. H beta, hold that H beta up to your eye and look up, and there it is. It's not easy to see, but you can see it. And That's you don't true. want to use a telescope then because no, it's not smart. even binoculars. You can probably see it better in binoculars, but you can still see it naked eye with the filter. Huh. I've yeah. got some seven by 35s that have a 10 degree field of view. Maybe I should try those. That could yeah, be get some get some filters on that. Yeah. Uh, there. No, no, I'll borrow somebody's filter. <laughs> <laughs> it's the OPS option. You know, other people's scopes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so, so anyway, uh, Barnard's loop is not the only sign of this supernova. We have uh, several runaway stars that have been uh, traced back to, uh, to the supernova, and they're not in Orion. One of them is uh, in Auriga, the AE Auriga, and we have 53 Arietis, which I guess means it was in Aries, and then Mu Columbia. Columbia, which I guess would be pretty far south for us. Uh, but they're likely accelerated, that they may have been part of multiple star systems and were torn apart as a result of the supernova. And so the angular momentum shot off various stars in, in different directions. Uh, it's quite a ride. Um, so here, I'll go to the next guy. Okay, and hang on a moment. Bear with me just a moment here. Here we go. So here's, here's some context for you with Barnard's loop. Down here, you have the Orion Nebula. And uh, up here, I think, is NGC 1975. There's M43. There's a horse head. And <clears throat> there is Orion's belt. Now, what's interesting about this, to me, is that this arc looks like it's centered right here below this clump of gas in uh, in Orion's belt, but evidence seems to show that it's coming from the Orion Nebula, several different kinds of evidence, including tracing back the lines from these runaway stars. So why is it not centered on that? If you notice over here, this is a very sharply defined uh, dense line of, uh, of glowing gas. Over here, it's quite a bit more diffuse and closer in. <coughs> My guess is that the interstellar medium is thicker here and probably slowed down that part of the supernova remnant. And uh, I didn't find any uh, direct research on this, but if anybody else knows something about that, please chip in. I I'm curious. Just noticed this as I was reviewing the lecture and it's, it's kind, of a, kind of an interesting question. Okay. Where are we here? It could also be that the, the entire OB association is moving through space in that direction towards the, 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 uh, the brighter portion of the Barnard's loop and it's, and it's uh, compressing it more and it's more diffuse um, on the side. Uh, uh, possibly, although the supernova itself sounds like it was uh, in the Orion Nebula. So it would have been moving along with the rest of the stars in the Orion right. Nebula. Of course, the right. supernova might not have stayed put either. Right that it could have gotten a kick as just a result. And it could have been part of a multiple star system and then wound up heading off in its own direction. <coughs> mm. Anyway, so here we have uh, AE Auriga, this star right over here. And it's running away from the trapezium at 56 kilometers per second. Uh, that's fast. Um, it's, it's lighting up the Flaming Star Nebula, not just, uh, not just uh, Al Alnitak I was talking about before, but it wasn't formed inside of the Flaming Star Nebula. It's passing through it at high speed and there's a violent bow shock wave in, in front of uh, AER Riga and it's sending off a lot of electromagnetic radiation at the same time. So it'd be quite a ride to be on a, uh, on a planet in that system. Um, 
Do I want to be there? Uh, somebody says there's places you can visit, but you don't want to live there. And there's also uh, supposedly an ancient Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. And it could also go along, may you live in an interesting place. I, I like boring places myself. I'll, I'll visit through my telescope, thanks. Um, okay, so here's a Riga. And here we have uh, cometary clouds. Okay, now here's the trapezium. And this is the Witch Head Nebula here. And uh, it is, uh, you can see that in a telescope. It's fairly faint and it's a reflection nebula. So it turns up, usually shows up blue. And uh, hang on a moment. So it's in Eridanus. It's about 900 light years away from Earth. So it's not quite part of the Orion molecular cloud. It's a little bit too close for that. Um, but it's reflecting blue light from, uh, from Rigel primarily. And Rigel is also closer than uh, most of the Orion molecular cloud as well. But, uh, but it is on the outer boundaries of something called the Orion Eridanus bubble. And, uh, and the bubbles are kind of interesting. They're super shells of gas that were of molecular hydrogen blown out by Hamas star from the Orion OB1 association. So, uh, so these bubbles are again, part of the texture of, of interstellar space. And uh, we are ourselves in a super bubble. Our sun is embedded in a super bubble that's uh, what? One or 200 light years across. And we can tell that because space inside of our bubble is considerably more transparent than the space outside of that bubble. And that implies that somewhere where, uh, where our sun lives, there was a supernova in the distant past and it carved out the gas that we're traveling in. So uh, that may have happened after the formation of our solar system because uh, you know, there was enough gas to form a protostar where we are. So somewhere, within the last 5 billion years, but, but not recently. And sometimes these super shells are carved out by multiple supernovas. One thing I might wanna mention here, these really bright stars, they have lifetimes on the order of millions of years. And so you're looking at an area like one of these associations where you're seeing O and B class stars. Well, 10 million years from now, they'll all be gone. They will have all blown up and uh, and the Orion molecular cloud itself may not be there anymore. These are all very short lifetimes. And so, oh, yes, in back. Sorry? Well, I, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later on here. I'm, I'm just about to get there. I'm gonna talk about protostars and so forth. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting part of this whole process. Um, this is kind of a fun slide, iron bullets. Well, this doesn't say about how the stars form, but, uh, but sometimes the star birth can be violent. And uh, these, are, uh, these are bright columns of dust and gas that were shot out from, uh, from star formation, maybe some larger protostars than just say a sunlight star. And, uh, and so, these are traveling very, very fast through the, uh, through the nearby medium. I was talking about AE Auriga being 56 kilometers per second. These are traveling at 400 kilometers per second, about a thousand times the speed of sound. And uh, they're called iron bullets because right at the very tip of them is uh, superheated uh, iron gas. And most of these are, are molecular and ionized hydrogen. And, uh, and the hydrogen in these, in these uh, bullets is uh, interacting violently with the hydrogen gas they're passing through. And so it all gets superheated and fluoresces at thousands of degrees. And the, uh, the tips of these are about 5,000 degrees C. Yes? So stars are moving up to the north, or are they being pushed down towards the left? Uh, in this image, they are moving up to the right. You're, what you're looking at uh, 
these things here are at the head and this is trailing behind. And this is, this is kind of a, uh, a shock wave, if you want, composed of uh, a violently interacting gas after this head shot through. Uh, no, no, they're not. They're more like Herbig Harrow objects. These would have emanated from most likely a large protostar or maybe several. It's unclear exactly what formed these, but it says that they were violent, uh, violent uh, after effects of star birth. Oh yeah, I I'm getting to the protoplasts, believe me. <laughs> we're getting there, we're getting there. They're just, they're a lot of fun. Okay, oh, no, hang on, I didn't want that. Okay, so here you go. Now you've got uh, Bach globules and you've got proclids. And they look similar in a lot of ways, but they have somewhat different histories. Um, so Bach globules are isolated and uh, relatively small dark nebula. And uh, they are dense concentrations of the dust and gas where star formation may take place. And because they're so dense, it's uh, more likely they're gonna be formed in the middle of molecular clouds. Um, and they found, you'll find them within H2 regions. And they've usually got about two to 50 solar masses of stuff, mostly hydrogen. And they're about a light year or so across. So you've got molecular hydrogen, carbon oxide, that's where carbon mon monoxide would come in there and carbon dioxide, of course, and helium, and maybe 1% of silicate dust. And uh, these Bach globules tend to form either double or multiple star systems, but they are not right in the middle of, uh, of these uh, high ionization stars. Now the proplids are next to the high ionization stars, stands for ionized protoplanetary disk. So they're externally illuminated, photo evaporating, proto, proto, protoplanetary <laughs> disks around a young star. And uh, nearly 180 proplids, I only saw a couple dozen, 180 proplids have been discovered in the Orion Nebula. Um, and they're always found near hot blue giant stars, such as the trapezium. And like I was saying before, they're caught up in a race between birth and death. And the hard UV from the stars simultaneously compacts and erodes the proplid. So it's getting smaller, but at the same time, it's getting denser. And uh, so maybe it makes it and maybe it doesn't. Okay, here's a protostar. I love protostars. Um, and you can see the, uh, the, the shadows of these uh, uh, protoplanets here forming away from something that may or may not have started to fuse. It could just be condensing under gravity and getting to the point of fusion. Um, so, <clears throat> This is the earliest phase of uh, stellar evolution. So for a low mass star like the sun or lower, it lasts about 500,000 years. The phase begins when the molecular cloud fragment first collapses under the force of self-gravity and an opaque pressure supported core forms inside of the, uh, of the collapsing fragment. And so when the infalling gas is depleted, it leaves behind a, uh, a pre-main sequence star, and it later contracts more and becomes a main sequence star, right beginning to fuse hydrogen into helium. But the gas that collapses toward the center forms first the, the protostar, then the protoplanetary disk, and which orbits the object. And <clears throat> as the collapse continues, the gas is more likely to hit the disk than to hit the star. And uh, this has something to do with angular momentum conservation. Um, the closer in it gets, the more it's liable to move a, a, a sideways, uh, just you know, like, like a comet does, for instance. <coughs> um, so it does spiral inwards toward the protostar, and there's a lot of theoretical effort going into figuring that out, and we still don't fully understand it. One thing I love about science is that the deeper you look into things, the more questions you get. And uh, I have a saying, the boundaries of our ignorance expand faster than the boundaries of our knowledge. It's sort of like the receding edge of the universe. So 
we're ignorant today about things that we didn't even know existed earlier. So I like questions. Um, so anyway, what are we saying about this? Okay, so if you're looking at a protostar, you wanna use something like the James Webb Space Telescope or maybe some, uh, some sub-millimeter radio telescopes because they're not emitting that much visible light. And whatever visible light the uh, central star may be emitting could be blanketed out by the, uh, the circumstellar disk. So JWST will pull these guys out for you. Because <coughs> there is gonna be a lot of infrared light in there. Not quite a sharp point source either. Um, but the long, wa long wave radiation is more likely to show a point source. And so that's, you're gonna wanna use the uh, radio telescope for that. Okay, here's a proplid forming a, a protostar. And uh, so you can see uh, the dust particles are, are clumping together deep inside the protoplanetary disk. The radiation eats away at the, at the disk and this, uh, this, here, this here is your shock wave uh, forming where the gas is being uh, compacted by the UV radiation. And here's, uh, here's shock from the, uh, the interstellar wind because chances are the protostar is not moving at the same speed as the medium around it. So, so you've got a head here of concentrated superheated gas and then a tail of cooler, cooler material trailing <laughs> behind it. Um, so here you're, you can see what you would be getting the compaction and the erosion at the same time. And then you're also getting, as the gas from the protoplanetary disk falls in to the protostar, you get these strange jets shooting out in both directions. It looks a lot like the jets that spew out from active galaxies, but on a much, much smaller scale. This is one of those self-similar phenomenon you run into, um, like Saturn's rings and uh, spiral galaxies, that kind of thing. Um, so here, where do we go from here? Okay, and here's, here's getting into the anatomy of a proplid. And uh, here you've got the ionization front, and here you've got your disc and here's a jet shooting out in both sides. And this is not ionized gas here, this is neutral gas. And, uh, and this entire perimeter here is the ionization front. Um, and up here, it says you are screen sharing. But this point, okay, this is pointing toward the trapezium. I can figure that out. So this is, uh, this is being burned and condensed by the trapezium itself. Okay, and here are more of our proplids. Look at them all. They're so cute. Um, here's one of the larger ones and you can see that there's a very dense concentration inside of it. This here doesn't look like all the others. I'm not quite sure what to say about that black clump, but the rest of these all have the same kind of structure, the same kind of appearance to them. And uh, some of them will make it. Uh, we're looking right inside of the Orion Nebula. This is right in the trapezium. And this is where all the action happens because right there, surrounded by those four stars and one of them is actually quite a bit brighter than the other three. And uh, as a, uh, an OB star, it's generating most of its light in the ultraviolet. And it's just plays hob with the gas and the dust, but condenses things. So you're not gonna see these some distance from a, a group of stars that are that bright. <coughs> hmm. And over here, we have some proplets. And uh, here you can see, they're, they're probably all moving at different speeds. This one looks like it's moving at quite a clip. And uh, you can see we're all, we've got all these scales here, 250, 500 AU. So these are considerably larger than our solar system maybe uh, 10 times the orbit of Neptune. Um, and we have more of them. This is again, some kind of mosaic you could put up on your wall. Although I think much as I like these, I think if I had a mosaic of planetary nebula, it would just be a delight. I'd wanna backlight them. I'd want all of the colors. And uh, anyway, for another time.
Um, but you can see here, you've got two fairly, these two here, I don't know if this is two proplids that are merging or whether it just, you're, you're seeing some light coming through the middle of it. Again here, I think you're looking at a protostar with the uh, protoplanetary disk on edge. And you can just see the light from the protostar in the middle. And uh, you see several of them that are that kind of shape. All kinds of morphologies here. This one, I don't know what this is. This reminds me, Willie would recognize this. Doesn't this look like the horn of plenty of trouble from Star Trek? The planet eater, the planet eater exactly. Yes, <laughs> um, hopefully not. Okay, and here we go. Protostar lightsabers. So these Herbig Harrow objects are generated by these powerful jets of, uh, of gas, ionized gas shooting out from the polar axis of the forming star. And I can't explain to you the electromagnetic physics of what's going on there. And if anybody understands it, please tell me, but we may have a shortage of those kind of people around. This is still a bit of a mystery as far as I know. So, so these narrow gas jets of partially ionized gas are ejected by the stars and they're colliding with the surrounding gas at very high speed, several hundred kilometers per second, going back to what we were looking at with those iron bullets. And uh, you can sometimes see several of them around a single star aligned with its rotational axis. Most of them are about several light years or a parsec uh, from their source. Some of them have been observed several times that far away. And they're transient. They only last a few tens of thousands of years. And they're moving so fast they can change visibly just over the time span of a few years. So it's uh, very rapidly, I mean, things in interstellar space don't change that fast, but this is one of them. This would be changing even faster than say a recently exploded supernova, or the gas around that. Um, so uh, Hubble Space Telescope was looking at a number of these and uh, it says over a few period of few years, parts of the nebula fade and others brightened as they collide with the material in the interstellar gas, which is varies in density, it's kind of clumpy. So uh, different things happen at, at different times on here, this is dramatic. Herbig Harrow 111 in the OMB, in the Orion B molecular cloud. Um, look, how, look how tight that is. And uh, this almost looks like shock diamonds you see coming out of a, uh, of a rocket exhaust. I don't think they're shock diamonds, but the, the resemblance is, is dramatic. Um, so, this is coming from a protostar with a luminosity of about 25 suns and uh, driving force of the jets, of course. It's embedded in uh, a 30,000 30, uh, mass of sun cloud core. Yeah, question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I don't have this information here, but, uh, but it does say something about the size of it. Um, hang on, let me see. What does it say? Uh, well, based on what I was reading before, this, this could be as much as a parsec in length. Um, but it's got a very short lifespan to it. It's, it's only 800 years old. Um, and they found another pair of bipolar jets in the near infrared at an angle of 61 degrees to this one. Now, if this is formed by rotation of a protostar, what's coming off at 61 degrees? The only thing I could guess would be that there are two stars in a binary star configuration and that they're not rotating in the same axis. Um, I'm open to other suggestions. But yeah, that, it says that was taken as evidence of a system with multiple protostars. Okay, and uh, one last slide for you. This is a weird one. This doesn't have anything to do with any of the other slides, except 
that it ties in with the Orion molecular cloud. This is a reflection nebula shining from the light of a variable star. Um, it's south of M42, right at the edge of the molecular, Orion molecular cloud. And uh, so it's got this sideways T shape in it. And originally, it's, so the T shape is about 10 light years across. And originally thought, okay, that is a dark clump of gas. It's masking what's in front of it. And uh, they looked deeper and found out that, uh, that it wasn't a dark cloud at all. It really is a hole. It's a place where the gas has been blasted away. And they think it was blasted away by, uh, by some of these Herbig Harrow objects. So you really are looking at a hole here. Um, and it says the stellar jets were pushing through the surrounding material at hundreds of kilometers per second. And uh, anything that was in their way just got pushed out. And you can't see the jets right now, but this could be a remnant of them. And that's all the material I've got. I always like to put up this Martian crater. A uh, question in the back. I could, I could. This one. One more. Uh, you want this one? Okay. Oh. Uh, what was the name of that? Hang on, let me catch the name of it because it would be a fun. This is NGC nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, it's, a, a it's fairly easy to see. It's bright. It's it's pretty cool. Uh huh. So you've looked at it. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, I don't think I've looked at that yet, but now I'm going to make a point of it. Uh, Got to wait till the winter. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. HH -H stands for Herbig Harrow. It's those, those bright jets of very fast so, gas. So it's, it's the star is emitting the jets, and the Herbig Harrow object shows what happens when the jets interact with the media around them. Okay. If the media was empty, you probably wouldn't even see them. Uh, Herbig Harrow object is an area that's being influenced by the jets. Well, it is the jet plus the surrounding medium. Okay. It's, it, okay. it's the interface between them is very hot and violent. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think I've seen any of those objects either, but I suspect I could. Um, and um, I'm open for any other questions at this point. What's that? Ah, it is a smiley face. Originally, yes. Oh, back there again, yes. No, there's no dumb questions. <laughs> okay, here, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> um, well, we haven't, since we've had large telescopes, we have not seen any supernovas in our galaxy. We saw one in uh, one of the Magellanic Clouds back in 1987. Um, but we're watching the sort of prelude to a supernova while we like while we watch Betelgeuse. So um, we just we need to look in in more space and, and not, we, we haven't really seen one in the act in in real time. So Betelgeuse is going to take like millions of years to happen. Maybe only a hundred thousand years. Can you wait? <laughs> I, actually, I I read something recently about uh, Betelgeuse that it could happen very very soon, like maybe in our lifetimes. I mean, probably not, but it, it they're saying it is possible. I saw that too. Uh, well, I think what it really says is that we don't fully understand the time scales yeah, yeah. of these things, and the fact that it's a variability cycle changed so dramatically is one of those things they're still trying to figure out. And maybe that's an early sign that it's getting very unstable inside of Betelgeuse. So what I heard about was a preprint. So it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. Ah, watch this space. So, but, it, and it's, it's computer modeling of different stellar evolution models. And then they fit to the cycle time. Uh-huh. And take, all these different model runs and find out what that, what they extrapolate to the lifetime. Okay, and well, yeah, they have lifetime. to find stellar evolutionary models that are covering 
that interval of a star's life though? Right. And how many of those are there? I don't know. I haven't read the preprint. I heard about it from someone else, but uh -huh. um, but also each model has parameters and you change the parameters to try to fit the, the data. So there's different classes of models and then each parameter set is a model and you try and scan them all and see which ones fit a pattern. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll wait to see if that I'll find is issued. Link. I'll find a link to it. And yeah, if you could send it along to me, I'd greatly appreciate it. Okay. I could work that into this talk next time I give um, it. Well, it's it has not been peer reviewed. I understand. Yeah. I got time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay, if that's it. Thank you all for inviting me.